And thank you, Patty and Aaron, for the offertory blend of several familiar sacred hymns. Thank you so much. Where are our violin players out here? Who plays the violin out here? Oh, I know better than that. Dustin, your hand's not up. Where are our other violin players? Okay, we've got a few scattered there. Thank you for that. Violin's interesting. Interesting instrument. Aaron does a good job. John chapter 14, our Bibles this morning, we're turning together to John's Gospel, chapter number 14. John 14, begin reading in the first verse. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Let's pause and pray. Father, would you at this moment take our distracted thinking and submit it to the truths that we've just uncovered in John 14. And Lord, we're going to see some disturbing truths this morning. You've placed them there to disturb our apathy and our self-deception in ways. And Lord, would you by your spirit come and invade the service so that we'll not be able to escape the truth of your word. And Lord, we don't want to put in our time this morning just to be here. But we want it to be a meeting with the God of heaven. So would you grant that appointment even now? work freely in our hearts and our midst. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It is something I rarely do, and that's repeat a message. It's not exactly the same message, but a similar message from a similar passage that uh, some of our high school students and teachers had to endure on last uh, Friday in, in chapel. But God wouldn't let me get away from it. Just kept bringing me back to this passage, and, and I believe it's for this morning. Whenever the Lord indicates by His Spirit, we'll do something, then we'll do it, shouldn't we? And it'd be far better off if we do it more often. That is, if we were tuned in to where we could. And I would uh, sadly uh, note in, in my life that that's not often enough. John chapter 14, we find a disturbing, disturbing passage. It's a wonderful portion. It's a portion of scripture that is used to give comfort and blessed hope for those that have had loved ones fall asleep in Christ, who have uh, died physically and have gone on before. It uh, reassures us of, of the way to heaven, of the way to uh, the Father's mansions. Uh, Jesus uh, spoke this uh, just the evening before his betrayal and arrest, shortly before his crucifixion. There are wonderful, wonderful truths that uh, blossom freely uh, from this. 
it is uh, probably one of the uh, most uh, important chapters of paramount, uh, paramount importance in this whole portion of John. I'm finding myself looking more and more and more at the details that Jesus left knowing what would face his disciples. But the most troubling aspect of this passage that we read is this that in John chapter 14, Jesus addressed three of his disciples by name. Uh, three of them by name. He spoke uh, to Thomas, and he spoke later on uh, to, to Philip, and also to Judas, not uh, Judas Is Iscariot, but three by name. And there were three things that can be discerned that were true uniformly of all three of these disciples, these apostles that Jesus spoke to. Now, if you could go back for a moment backwards and think of the scenario uh, the Lord had just instituted the Lord's Supper around that table in the upper room uh, just shortly before this. Uh, he had girded himself with a towel. He had uh, washed his disciples' feet. He had taught them things about uh, service. Uh, he had prepared constantly, had attempted to prepare them uh, for his sacrifice at Calvary. And the fact that he would go away, uh, but that he would send another just like him, the Comforter by name, the Holy Spirit. And yet somehow the disciples missed it all. And the three that he addresses in John 14, there is a sad conclusion that after three years of ministering among Jesus, uh, here is the record. Verse number seven, Jesus says first to Thomas, if ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. Now, this is a conditional sentence given in Scripture. A conditional sentence means it may or may not be true. There's some question, there's some doubt. We can understand from the context, sometimes from the construction in Scripture as to the veracity as to which way it was. But when Jesus says to Thomas, if ye had known me, the conclusion is crystal clear. He did not know the Lord. Now, that's going to create a lot of questions in your mind and, and maybe uh, cause you to make some, some wrong turns somewhere along the way. Uh, I've recently wondered about some of these things myself. For instance, at what point, at what point were, uh, were the apostles, the disciples of the Lord Jesus, actually converted? When, when were they saved? Well, that'd be open for a lot of interesting discussion. We know that one of them never was. He's burning in, in a literal hell right now tonight or today and has been for 2,000 years and, and shall be eternally. But at what point were they actually converted? There's some hint perhaps about Peter in certain ways. And, and yet these that accompanied with Jesus for all these years, and let me remind you of what they did. You know, there's one verse we read, verse number 12. Jesus talked about the greater works. He said, the works that I do, uh, you're going to do in greater works. Well, think of the works that these disciples actually had been involved in, in doing. Do you remember on two separate occasions, they were commissioned and sent out. They were given powers over unclean spirits, over the devils. They were given unconditional powers over physical ailments so that they could administer healing supernaturally to people that they, uh, they encounter? Do you remember these uh, wonderful powers that they were gifted with and given, and they went and ministered in the Lord's name? That's pretty important, isn't it? Pretty significant. And yet, there's evidence in John 14, they did not even know the Lord. Jesus indicates that. Thomas, if you had known me. And then he addresses Philip uh, down in verse uh, number, number eight. And in the ninth verse, uh, Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Here's the second. Philip didn't know Jesus. Do you remember that uh, some of these names are used with regard to some not notable uh, miracles? For instance, the breaking of the bread, the feeding of thousands from a small portion of physical elements of food that were delivered in the hands of Jesus for his breaking. And yet these had not known. They'd been such a long time with Jesus, and yet they did not know him. And then there's the third instance, of course, of Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas uh, of the disciples. And the indication, if you'll read that later in the chapter, I ask that you not do that now so it'll not detract from the, the direction we're headed with this message. But the, the clear and uniform indication is that at least three in chapter 14 uh, could be sadly said, did not know the Lord. How in the world could that be? 
How in the world could that have happened? What is it that stood in the way of these three knowing the Lord Jesus? Well, we can think of some things, and we're given some evidence from Scripture, some things that kept them from knowing the Lord. You remember on numerous occasions, they were more concerned about themselves than they were with Jesus. Do you remember that? They're having discussion. Which would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They seem to be stuck on that. In fact, at one time, uh, two of them had their mother come and ask a special favor of Jesus. Lord, would you allow this, my son, to be at your left hand and my other boy at your right hand? And uh, Jesus brushed that away quickly. But it tells us uh, something of their, their thinking. And I would submit to you this morning that there are some lessons for us. Now, we're, this is is not beat up on the disciples' morning. That's not the purpose for us uh, getting together in this message. But I'll tell you this, right off the bat this morning in the sermon, if these 11, 12 apostles could company with Jesus for the three plus years and participate in all that they did with Jesus, then it could happen to you and me too, couldn't it? It could be that our room is filled this morning with people that don't really know the Lord Jesus. And so I would remind you that even as of they, of us, it could be said that when our concerns, our interests, our things get in the way of uh, the Lord's things, then it keeps us from even knowing the Lord as we should. This is a battle that all of us would fight and struggle because we're, we're humans. We have uh, flesh. We have uh, things that we, we deal with. In fact, we all like ourselves very well, don't we? I was dealing with Richard this week, not put Richard on the spot. We were talking about some things concerning the website and some uh, brochures and some things that we're getting ready to, to print and revamp and everything. And the subject came up of having my picture on a certain thing. I said, I don't want my picture on it. And uh, Richard thought, well, it would be a nice thing if you had a picture of the pastor. But I had to explain to him, uh, the reason I don't because it's not about me. I don't want the first thing that people think is, is about this pastor. It's not about me. And besides that, I'm not very pretty to look at anyway. So it may serve a, a wrong purpose to have a uh, pastor picture on, on the thing. But, uh, you know, if we can just uh, let it occur to us that it's, it's all about him. And if we can, as Bruce Lackey said, know him more dearly, more closely, that I I may know him. I think of the words echoing back from our, our brother that's now in the Lord's presence. He knows him now uh, more intimate and dearly than we. Uh, but back to John chapter 14, it can happen to them, it can happen to us. Not only could it happen, but let's look at some of the results, some of the impact of not knowing the Lord. Well, it's found first in the first words that Jesus spoke in the beginning of the chapter, let not your heart be troubled. Now, why did Jesus say that? Because they were troubled. And they would be soon more troubled than that. You know, it's similar to the phrase that Paul uses in the New Testament. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. He uses it repeatedly. Do you know why he uses it? Because the brethren were ignorant. <laughs> that, that ignorant means uh, not a bunch of bumbling idiots, but it means uninformed as to scriptural truths. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning, and he, he would set them straight. Uh, the reason it's used is because that was the condition. So when Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, um, that's exactly what was happening. They were troubled, and they would soon be greatly more troubled than that. In fact, let your eyes fall down, if you would, to verse 27. We didn't read that far in the chapter. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Okay, second, second aspect of this would be no peace. Did you know those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ have no peace? Think of the sources of peace that people are exploring or experimenting with in this world today. Some people try uh, drugs and alcohol and chemicals and, and whatever to, to obtain peace. Well, it's not there, is it? Uh, you can make yourself non-coherent and immune to some of the pressures and even the thoughts that may come in you. But brother, sooner or later, you've got to wake up. And it just doesn't give any lasting peace. This is a world devoid of, of peace and short of knowing the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus himself. It is not available. We go on in verse number 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Again, there's a second rephrase struck concerning this. He begins, let not your heart be troubled. In verse number 1, verse 27, he's so concerned about their, their troubledness. Neither let it be afraid. 
So we say clearly, not knowing the Lord Jesus is going to produce three things. It's going to produce uh, troubled, unpeaceful, and fearful people. So fear and trouble and lack of peace uh, can be exchanged, can be given over by an intimate knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, what do you mean by knowing Jesus Christ? Well, it's true that all of us would know something about Jesus. I guess we would be hard-pressed any, anymore, even though it would be possible to uh, find folk in our uh, common population today that uh, would know nothing whatsoever about Jesus, but most of us still would have some idea idea, and certainly church-going people, perhaps people that have been involved in, in church work, per se, for years, uh, know a lot about Jesus, but that's not the same as knowing Jesus. You can know a lot about him and be ignorant as to the person of the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, religious people know about, they know about but they don't know him. In fact, there are lost people uh, on their way to a Christless eternally, totally eternity, uh, and they, they know about him, but they do not know him. I would submit to you that nestled within all of Jesus' discourse in John 14 is the word believe. Believe. It's found in verse 1. He introduces to that. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. To know Jesus is to believe Jesus. Now, not just to believe in. And of course, believe in is part. Uh, it's entry level. It's ground level faith. Uh, we believe the facts concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, but not only to believe in him, uh, but to believe on him and to believe him, his very person. And interestingly enough, in John 14, Jesus also gives us the, uh, the prophesied full um, unfolding of how it is that his disciples would get to know him. Now, I would submit to you that the disciples did not know Jesus that night. They did not know him at Calvary, although they were getting acquainted somewhat when they remembered the things that he had spoken. But soon after that, they did get acquainted, but Jesus would be gone. And they became acquainted with him through his spirit. Jesus said, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send, we're down to verse number 26, uh, the, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And we do find evidence in later portions of Scripture in the Gospels and, of course, later in, in the Epistles that the Spirit of God brought the very words of God, the Word of God, to life so that they remember what, what Jesus had said. And they say, oh, yeah, now it makes sense. Yes, I remember Jesus said that, but I sure missed it then. Well, we're in the same boat today as believers. We do not know him as we should. And I, I would submit to you that part of the solution this morning is to call upon the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the sweet Holy Spirit who lives within, who indwells if we indeed are, are cleansed by the blood of Jesus by faith, if we receive that which Jesus has done, we would call upon him to make known the Son to us, not just in knowledge, not just in information and data, but in realness as the person. That is the missing element in church today. I was uh, reading recently how that uh, the 20 and 30 something uh, crowd is uh, completely abandoning organized religion in church today. And I partly know why. I partly know why. Because much of what is being abandoned is just going through the motions. Just going through the motions. All the service times are being met. I was intrigued talking to Mac and AJ on the return back from the, from the British Isles and some sad, sad, sad reports they, they brought. Um, I, I had uh, talked with Mac before the went. I said, Mac, when you get to Wales, I want you to tune in to the matters uh, historically about the Welsh revival of the early 1900s and so forth and see what you can find out. You know what Mac said? He came back from Wales. They knew nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Uh, one of the mightiest revivals where, uh, where the, the, the entire country was impacted, I mean thoroughly, with the truth of God's word. And countless tens of hundreds of thousands of people were saved, were regenerated, and, and Christians just brought into a real and, and abundant life in Christ. And a hundred years later, they know nothing 
whatsoever. In fact, some were rather defensive about it and told Mac, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not us. That was those little chapels here and there. We didn't need anything like that. We weren't involved in anything like that. Speaking of their church with their stained glass and, and all of the, the rest, the fact is that sometimes people are abandoning dead religion because it's just that. Nothing there. No reality. No Christ. And I would tell you that the disciples had already played into that error. They were with him, but they didn't know him. And this morning, if I had about three hours, and Max said that uh, there wouldn't be any preaching, but he didn't know that there was enough that we could just spill this thing over hours and hours and hours, and we still have lots to do this morning. Uh, but if we had time, and maybe it'll continue over tonight in the evening service, uh, we, we need to get acquainted with our Savior. We do. You say, what do we need to do? Throw the Bible away and get into some side of a, a weird experiential type of religion? Uh, no, not saying that at all. It all is going to be scriptural, right, according to God's word. But we need to get acquainted with him who died for us, with him who lives for us, with him who lives in us, and with him who is to be... Uh, our propulsion in this age in victory and in, in great service for him. We don't know the Lord Jesus, even as Jesus alluded to in John 14. Uh, those that lived and circled and ministered and, and, and were with him for all that time did not know him. If you had, you would have done this. What would Jesus say about us today? Well, we're going to have to hold that thought for just a little bit, but I think it's enough to introduce a horrendous problem in many of our hearts. Oh, yes, we know about him. Yes, we've been on board. I, uh, I think that uh, there was a message that I heard earlier this year. It was uh, a message by evangelist Jonathan Barber. He's been in our church before, been here for some time with the, um, the NETS training uh, session. It would have been a year ago, a little bit more, and John Barber's a, a young evangelist, and there was a cancellation. A, a big-name speaker, preacher, was supposed to be at, at the meeting that we're at, and John Barber was just suddenly called upon to preach, and he, and he just went before God and said, God, what should I preach? And he, he brought a message that impacted me forever and some other people that I know to do uh, as well. But th his message was about faithful or full of faith. Faithful or full of faith? Our whole concept of faithfulness, faithfulness, it's more than just being in your seat every time. You know, we got people that sit in the same seat all the time. You couldn't blast them out of there with a stick of dynamite. They'd still be there. I'm not down on if you're doing that. Uh, sometime back, our, our folks decided to have some fun with their pastor, so they had a little meeting somehow before, and they said, what we're going to do, we're going to scramble everything up, and everybody that sits on this side is going to sit on that side, and everybody over here, over there, and everybody was all mixed up, and I walked in, I didn't know anybody. Because everybody was moved out of their, their places. And I know it was hard for some people to do because we're creatures of, of habit. But, you know, faithfulness is not just sitting in the same seat. And uh, I, I can appreciate that. I'm, I'm a creature of habit, too. I am. I really am. Uh, but, you know, faithfulness is not just being in one spot all the time. Trees do that, don't they? <laughs> you catch on? <laughs> Trees do that. But there's no spiritual virtue in that, is there? I like trees and all that. But you know, faithful or full of faith. The disciples in ways could have been deemed faithful. Maybe. Not all of them were even that. They weren't full of faith. But in 50 days, they were full of faith. Something happened between this time in John 14 and 51 days later. And his name was the Holy Spirit. And that's the key to knowing Jesus. He is the key. It's the same person. Spirit of Christ and Christ. They're one and the same. Can't portion them up, divide them up. And yet there's resistance in following him who God has left for our power, our benefit for our propulsion in this age today. I got to quit. We got other things to do. Let's pray. Father, you've opened some things to our, our heart and our eyes that I trust that you'll be working in the hearts of these, my hearers. And Lord, this is not my idea. 
is not, not my word. Lord, I pray that by your spirit you would do your work. Father, we come now to the invitation time where there are decisions that probably should be made. I pray that you'll superintend that. And Father, as we come up to the time in a few moments when we celebrate your table, I pray that it would be done in sincerity and in and meaningful experience together. So have your way just now in the invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen. Rob will lead us in number 389. Is your all on the altar? 389 in your majesty hymnals. Rob will lead us. I'll step down front if I could greet you and help you in any way to go uh, to another part of the building and, and look at God's word. Or if you need to come for the altar for prayer, uh, you feel free to, to respond however the Lord would lay upon your heart. 389. Shall we stand together as we sing? One other verse, our men will be making ready to have the Lord's Supper in just a few moments on the third together. Amen. 